Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Thousands of Kuwaitis protest changes to electoral system. Lebanese army struggles to control Tripoli as gunmen roam the streets. And hundreds of Libyan families flee Bani Walid. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. Thousands of Kuwaitis demonstrated last night to protest against the new electoral law. Eyewitnesses said police used tear gas and sound bombs to disperse protesters from in front of the government headquarters. Our Al Jazeera correspondent reported that security authorities arrested former member of parliament Walid al Tabtabawi, who participated in the demonstration. The public prosecution in Kuwait ordered the imprisonment of three former members of parliament from the opposition for 10 days, pending an investigation on charges of insulting the emir. The dignity of a nation is the theme chosen by political and youth forces as a title for their demonstration. The massive and unprecedented Kuwaiti demonstration was attended by tens of thousands. Protesters were not able to reach the gathering point that was chosen by the organizers who planned to hold a sit-in in front of the Ministerial Council building. Protesters said they took to the street to preserve and protect the Constitution. We are here today to preserve al Sabah and preserve Kuwait and to tell them that we are committed to the oath. We are present and will continue to go forward despite all of their methods. No housing, no education, no health care. What is left? The Constitution? If the Constitution is gone, we will all be gone. We must stand our ground to prevent any tampering with the Constitution. Security forces were heavily deployed and surrounded all squares and gathering points and cut off all roads leading to them, using sound and smoke bombs to disperse the gatherers. National Guards did not wait long and dozens of them were deployed to reinforce the special forces to disperse the protesters. Demonstrators standing against the voting mechanism of the electoral system chose this point in front of the Kuwait Towers after security forces were able to surround them in the three meeting spots set by youth and political forces. Before these protests, a search and seizure warrant was issued by the public prosecution against a number of opposition members of parliament, most notably MP Musalam Barak, ordering the imprisonment of three MPs for 10 days to continue the investigation on charges of insulting the emir. The three are two Islamists and a member of the Popular Action Bloc. According to some observers, this stalemate requires reasonable solutions. We rely on the reasonable judgment of His Excellency, the Emir. May God protect him. We hope this mobilization will seek to guarantee stability in the society amid the current political crisis. The stalemate that came as a result of the government's approval of the draft amendment of the electoral law, which allows each voter to elect one candidate instead of four in their electoral district, further fueled the crisis that could take some time to overcome. Saad al-Saidi, Al Jazeera, Kuwait. In Lebanon's city of Tripoli, the army imposed cautious calm after clashes and a violent night of gunfire and grenade explosions. Politically, there is a call for civil disobedience to take place on the front door of Prime Minister Najib Mekati's home. My colleague Nawal Beri reports from the north. The street of the city of Tripoli is still reacting to the assassination of Brigadier General Wissam al Hassan. While tension was confined in the past few days to the appearance of gunmen on the streets of the city, it has reached the neighborhoods of Jabal Mohsen and Bab al that are ready to erupt at any moment. During the violent nightly clashes, heavy and mid-range weapons were used as snipers spread on building rooftops. Clashes were limited by the morning to sporadic sniper fire. Look, the cars have bullet holes and people also fired at the bridge. This is why we are here. We are only responding. We still haven't dealt with them. If they continue to act like this, they will experience something they never have before. They will regret it. No one will leave Jabal Mosen if they continue. 
We won't allow a single worker, woman or man to leave if they continue to shoot at the bridge. Four people were killed and nearly 30 others were injured, some in critical condition. That is the outcome of the Jabal Muhsin and Bab al-Tabbani battles. The injured were spread across the city's hospitals. We have 14 cases so far, including one killed and 13 injured. Four of the injured are in the hospital and one of them is in critical condition. The rest were treated in the emergency room and released. The Lebanese army has been working since the morning to cut off the Maloule roundabout, the origin of the indiscriminate sniping. The army also entered a number of neighborhoods and detained some snipers and wanted individuals. And in an attempt to rein in on the street, the army took control of Abdel Hamid Karami Square and placed checkpoints on all its entrances, checking IDs and searching cars. The condom the nation of the assassination was not limited to the security situation in Tripoli, as some civil society members responded to the call of Minister Mu'ayn Merhabi to set up tents in front of Prime Minister Najib Mikati's home to demand his resignation. From this day forward, we are telling all the citizens not to pay their bills to the Lebanese government, be it electricity or water and especially phone bills. From now on, we will not consider paying any bill owed to the government. I don't want to speak about the steps the March 14th coalition will take before it does. So today, I will talk as a Lebanese citizen. As a Lebanese citizen, I think we should mobilize and use all peaceful means to topple this government. On the other hand, Minister Afyus Faisal Karami received the call from Defense Minister Faiz Ghusn, during which he confirmed that the level of insurgency in Beirut and Tripoli is unacceptable and will be dealt with tomorrow through patriotic and national means. The Lebanese army must take action and take firm, strong and wise action. The latest information I received is that the army has started to be seriously deployed to halt the tension between the areas of Bab al-Tabanna and Jabal Muhsin. Amid the vicious cycle of sporadic clashes in Tripoli, the Lebanese army remains the strong link in the city. Two days after angry gunmen besieged the city, the Lebanese army was deployed to the Hamid Karami Square and took control of all its entrances. And with that, the multi-level phase of retail taking control has started gradually in this city. From the Abdel Hamid Karami Square in Tripoli, Nawal Birre, New TV. The displacement of dozens of families from the city of Bani Walid continues due to the violent fighting witnessed in the city between government forces and armed militias. It was reported that 26 people were killed yesterday and 200 others were wounded. As Libya is commemorating the first anniversary of the downfall of Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi's regime, disorder remains the dominant force in the development of the Libyan case. At the moment, the most important is the ongoing fighting in Bani Walid, one of the most important strongholds of Muammar al-Qaddafi's supporters. Dozens were killed and injured so far in these ongoing clashes between government forces and armed militias inside the city and its surroundings. Every time the number of victims rises, the Libyan official discourse on the legitimacy of the goal of the clashes is renewed. The National General Congress says they aim to restore legitimacy and capture murderers and infiltrators. In contrast, the armed militias view government forces as attempting to commit genocide genocide against the city's inhabitants, since it includes Qaddafi supporters. And with both sides vowing not to surrender this battle, the residents of the city, which is inhabited by nearly 70,000 people, have no choice but to continue to migrate from Bani Walid. They're escaping the clashes and searching for a safe location. In solidarity with the residents of Bani Walid, protests are ongoing around around official Libyan headquarters, both the National Congress and Parliament, to demand an end to these clashes. The siege of Bani Walid by government forces started when armed militias inside the city refused to hand over those accused of torturing the person who revealed al-Qaddafi's whereabouts a year ago. Then, clashes erupted and people continued to get killed and injured.
In Jordan, the prosecutor general of the state security court filed terrorism-related charges against a group that was arrested after security foiled a terror plot aimed at striking vital centers and diplomatic missions. The 11-member group was planning suicide attacks using explosive belts and devices and car bombings. Our correspondent Sawa al-Sawalka reports from Amman. An Al-Qaeda-affiliated cell has been captured by the Jordanian security apparatus. The cell consists of 11 Jordanian citizens and was getting ready for a terrorist operation by carrying out explosions in two stages. The first by targeting commercial centers and the second by targeting diplomatic missions. The operation was foiled at birth and the government is saying it caught the perpetrators in the act. A group of people were arrested red-handed, meaning they're not just under suspicion or anything else. We were monitoring the case and all the details as they come in. For the third time, I want to point to another issue so you won't ask me where they came from. When the members of the group returned for the second time, they came through the Syrian-Jordanian border. It was reported that the cell tested highly explosive substances brought in from Syria. It had also put in place execution plans and monitored the targeted areas. According to observers, the group's unhindered movement can be traced to the security situation witnessed in Syria. There are those who want to fish in murky waters and those who want to fool the people by exploiting the presence of Jordanian movements, marches and protests. Some of which are obviously legitimate, but these terrorist groups wanted to carry out their plans through the turbulent situation and instability. The failed operation bore the name the 2nd November 29 in commemoration of the 2005 Amman hotel bombings that caused dozens of killed and injured. The government said foiling the plan is a message to the world that Jordan is a stable country. A new terror plot failed, yet it remains another attempt to target Jordan's stability. Observers here believe it was facilitated by the region's security and political developments. Salwa al-Sawalka, Dubai TV, Amman. Reports coming out of Myanmar suggest nearly a dozen people have been killed in fresh attacks against Rohingya Muslims. Buddhist extremists, supported by security forces, have set fire to Muslims' houses in two villages in Akyab district. Sources have told Press TV that security forces have provided assailants with gas to torch the houses of Muslim residents. Myanmar's government has already been under fire over the large-scale killings of Rohingyas a few months ago. The Muslim minority group has long been subjected to systematic abuse and violence. Hundreds of Rohingyas were killed in the western Rakhine state in recent months. Thousands more were displaced as a result. Reacting to the U.S.-made film which slanders Islam, international experts and lawyers have gathered in the Iranian capital, Tehran, to defend freedom of speech and call for universal laws to protect religious values. A correspondent, Ambar Nadari, has more. Freedom of speech or instigating public opinion. This was the main topic of discussion among experts, lawyers and Iranian officials who came together to discuss whether slandering religious beliefs should be labeled as the right to free speech or a deliberate attempt to instigate public opinion in the Muslim world. The speakers behind me say legal systems and society at large recognize the limits on freedom of speech, especially when freedom of speech conflicts with other values or rights. They say limitations to freedom of speech may follow the harm principle or the offense principle, and a case in point could be religious belief or hate speech. The speakers told Press TV that it is necessary to have freedom of expression if we are to avoid slandering true beliefs. But in the case of the U.S.-made anti-Islam movie called Innocence of Muslims, they say it is clear that those behind it had every intention to serve a political function. It's definitely an incitement, but the movie only managed to incite Muslim anger and get them to streets to condemn those who try to slander our holy prophets. This was an insult, not just to Islam, 
but also to all other religions and prophets. The campaign to insult not just Islam but also other religions is not sporadic or accidental. It was planned and those behind the blasphemous movie must realize that they are the dupes of this covert game. No doubt the psychologist film seeks to incite public opinion. Its makers are trying to portray Muslim communities undemocratic. They want to keep Muslims busy in order to plunder their riches. Experts say Western governments cherish freedom of expression only when it serves their own interests. For that, the international community should recognize the dangers of free speech in certain situations and come up with universal laws that protect all societies from harmful ideas. In addition to protest rallies, there should be a legal fight. We should try to devise laws to ban and criminalize blasphemous acts. This way we can stop or discourage the repeat of similar acts in the future. The blasphemous movie has provoked angry protests across the Muslim world, even in the West. That's why Muslim countries are urging the United Nations to frame laws that criminalize hate against any religion, including Islam. Aman Naderi, Press TV, Tehran. The recent civilian casualties and operations by U.S.-led forces in Afghanistan have sparked new waves of anti-U.S. protests in the war-torn country. The Syrian local coordination committees reported that 60 people were killed today. The most were in Damascus, its countryside, and in Homs. The coordination committees added that the killings and injuries resulted from the shelling on the towns of Marat al naman Kafar Nabul, and Kafar Ruma in Idlib. The Syrian Revolution's General Commission stated that regime forces shelled several neighborhoods in the cities of Homs and Aleppo. <laughs> A new day and the shelling is ongoing in several areas of Syria. Damascus and its countryside were a stage for violent air raids, according to several Syrian opposition sources. Tanks stormed al Kabun, a Damascus neighborhood, and the Zamalka quarter in its countryside. In the town of Salakin in Idlib province, the explosion extended to wide areas. These are videos by Syrian activists who say they show smoke rising from the heart of the capital, Damascus. In Marrat al Naman in Idlib, the shelling by rocket launchers is ongoing to take control of a Dev Valley. Warns part from the shelling. In return, fighters loyal to the Syrian regime are posting videos displaying their loyalty to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. The daily raids and killings in Syria continue, and the number of victims from both sides rises, a large percentage of whom are civilians. When any of our people are martyred, we take pride in them, and we announce that we have a person who was martyred and we publish the information. But the regime refuses to disclose the number killed by security forces. Every day there are several martyrs. Most are civilians because the regime is shelling civilian neighborhoods inhabited by residents. The regime has shelled residential neighborhoods that were safe, such as the neighborhood of Bani Zayed and the Al Muhandisian neighborhood. Observers in Damascus don't see clear signs for a truce in Syria. There are no real indications that there is a serious proposal to stop the violence in Syria. So I don't think this is a serious proposal because there are main issues that must be taken into account for things to proceed, such as stopping the flow of arms and fighters from abroad. In the town of Arrastan in Homs province, women without shelter, food or fuel are seeking help. We lack bread, food, everything. Even this child is in need of milk. All our children are crying because there's very little milk and food. We have nothing. Here in Deir Zur, children are hiding in trenches in fear of the raids. Nabi Watas, BBC.
In what appears to be yet another so-called price attack, attack by far-right Jewish extremists, a family-owned Palestinian taxi cab was set ablaze early this morning in the Arab village of Daria near Hebron. Hebrew graffiti reading price tag Susia was found spray-painted on a nearby wall. And in a separate development, the Jerusalem Magistrates Court today extended the remands of two minors from Beitar Elite and Givat Ze'ev, charged with vandalizing Palestinian vehicles in Jerusalem and the Etzion bloc. With the November 6th U.S. national elections just over two weeks away, all eyes will turn to the state of Florida tonight with the third and final debate between U.S. President Barack Obama and his Republican rival Mitt Romney will take place in Boca Raton. The 90-minute session will be devoted to foreign policy. The two are expected to spar over the September 11th terror attack in Benghazi, Iranian nuclear ambitions, and American support for Israel. While many around the world will be paying close attention to the substance of the foreign policy debate in the U.S., many factors play a role in the public's perception of the candidates. According to, a, to research conducted by the University of Haifa, many Israelis believe that Obama's middle name, Hussein, indicates that he is less than supportive of their country. More in this report from Reuters' Jim Drury. My fellow Americans. Despite regularly emphasizing his patriotism, Barack Obama still faces questions over his heritage. Some opponents label him a secret Muslim and jump on every public utterance of religious tolerance. As a citizen and as president, I believe that Muslims have the right to practice their religion as everyone else in this country. Intrigued by misinformed perceptions and the polarization over President Obama's background, researchers at Israel's University of Haifa and the University of Texas have examined the phenomenon, concentrating on one simple fact. Ever since Barack Obama decided to run for the presidency, there's been a worldwide buzz about his middle name. Barack Hussein Obama. No, you can. No, you can. Barack Hussein Obama was born in Hawaii to a black Kenyan father and white American mother. His much discussed birth certificate confirms his full name. But study co author Dr. Israel Weismal Manor says the name Hussein muddies the waters of public perception. In a controlled experiment, groups of Jewish Israelis, Arab Israelis and Americans watched a clip of Obama speaking. One group's screen was captioned President Barack Obama, while the other added his middle name. Participants from each group were then asked their opinion on Obama's Middle Eastern politics and their overall view of him. What we found is that the people among Israeli Jews that saw Barack Hussein Obama, they thought of him as less likable, they thought his peace initiative was less fair for the Israelis, and overall they thought that his sentiments towards Israelis was lower than the people who saw Barack Obama. Whether fair or not, the results are revealing, particularly in a country where more than 100,000 Israelis can vote in the U.S. presidential election. In a tight race, any lingering bias could be crucial. In Al Muthana province, the Young Journalists' Organization launched an educational campaign of awareness to educate people on the dangers of drugs and their negative effects. The campaign also aims to limit the spread of this dangerous disease, especially among the youth of the society. Under the title Youths Against Drugs, volunteers vowed not to take drugs by activating the role of education, raising awareness, and collecting signatures for the initiative. It was launched by the Young Journalists' Organization in the city of Samawa as part of a three-day awareness campaign. Volunteers displayed posters to raise awareness about the dangers of drugs that spread among youth circles. The youth who come to participate with us vow that they would not take drugs and vow to play a role in educating and raising awareness. Honestly, this campaign was in response to the spread of drugs among the youths. Media personnel praised the initiative, confirming the importance of promoting education and raising awareness among youth taking controlled substances and drugs, especially in the province of Al-Muthana, where most young people are spending their time in coffee shops, smoking water pipes day and night. 
حقيقة كان لدور الشرطة دور Honestly, the police did play a role in combating drugs and pursuing the dealers. But this is not the solution. The solution is eliminating this phenomenon by raising awareness before combating it. Awareness is very important. Even though the appropriate authorities confiscated a large quantity of pills and drugs, preemptive measures are also being taken along the border of Al Muthana with neighboring countries to prevent poisonous substances from entering the Iraqi society that rejects this phenomenon. Limiting drugs requires effective methods which include combating them strongly and preventing them from spreading among the youths by activating the role of families and government to create a drug free society. Ali Karim, Ali Arakia, Al Muthana. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.